Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Climate Emergency Advisory Committee consultative meeting for the 17th of January 2022. And I think the statute of limitations on Happy New Year is just about expired, but nevertheless, Happy New Year to you all. Um, so I'm going to be chairing today's meeting. I've got a few um, remarks to go through, as you all know, and then we can make a start on our agenda, which is quite a super interesting one and probably touching on some areas that uh, we're not that familiar with. So I think it's going to be an excellent meeting. So um, we're by live webcasting this meeting, as you know. It's in accordance with the Local Government Act 1972. So it's a remote consultative meeting of our Climate Emergency Advisory Committee. The consultative status of today's meeting is that some of the usual formalities will not play place at the start of the meeting. This also means that the committee will not be in a position to take any formal decisions and where necessary any proposed actions that do require formal ratification will be referred to the next public meeting of the committee for approval. Please can I remind members to turn the microwaves to mute when they're not speaking and to use the hand raise function to indicate they would like to speak as we move through the agenda. So I'm going to do introductions. So we're going to do them in alphabetical order. So count, start with Councillor Anderson. Councillor Barry Anderson, Madeline Wharfdale Ward. Thanks so much. Councillor Buckley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Neil Buckley, or Woodley Ward. Thank you. Councillor Carlill. Morning, everyone. Councillor Peter Carlill, Carlyle and Farsley Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dobson. Morning, Councillor Dobson, uh, Garfield and Sullinson Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Finnegan, has Councillor Finnegan joined us yet? I don't think so, Chair. Okie dokie. I know Councillor Flint um, having trouble with login details. Harriet, could you make sure she's been resent those, please? Yes. That's the meeting number and the passcode. Thank you so much. And she'll join us in due course. Councillor Forsyth. Oh, good morning, Councillor Forsyth. I'm in Whiteley Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Garthway is on um, some other council business at the moment and may join us if she can. Councillor Hartbrook. Councillor Comrade Hartbrook, Rothwell Ward. Thank you. Councillor Hayden. Councillor Helen Hayden, Temple Newsome Ward, an Executive Member for Infrastructure and Climate. Thank you. Councillor Illingworth. Councillor John Illingworth from Kirkstall Ward. Thank you. Councillor Shazad. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Mohammed Shazad from the Mortana Meanwood Ward. Thank you. Much appreciated. Councillor Wadsworth. Morning, Councillor Paul Waters, guys in Road and Ward. Thank you. And last but by no means least, Councillor Ray. Uh, Councillor Paul Ray, Hunslet and Riverside Ward. Thank you. And let's have our two officers introduce ourselves themselves. Um, Polly. Hi, Polly Kirk, Chief Officer for Sustainable Energy and Air Quality. Thank you so much. And Harriet. Good morning, Harriet Spate, Governance Officer. Thank you so much. Right, moving on to our agenda items. Agenda item number one, apologies for absence. We haven't received any apologies for today's meeting, Chair. Yeah, no, I think yeah, Councillor Garthway has been asked to attend some, some various council-related work things, um, okay. portfolio things, so I think she's engaged on those. Um, number two, declarations of interest. So members got any disclosable CUNY interests? I'll take silence as a resounding no. Now, the item three is, the, is our, the notes rather than minutes because this is a consultative meeting. Are there any matters arising from those? Looking at Polly and Harriet and members, people want to indicate. And that case notes, you know, I just tweak my laptop screen a bit. Thank you. Okie dokie, straight on to item four then, which is open forum. Now we have a submission from the Boston Spire and Weather Community Green Group that Harriet's going to um, read out and, and then we'll, we'll be sending a response in, in due course. But Harriet, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so the Secretary of Boston Spa and Weatherby Community Green Group have submitted the following. Um, so it says, bearing in mind the level of construction that is being outlined across the region for the next few years and the level of progress that has been made in, in the improvements to sustainability in-house building, why are building applications not being rejected if they are not towards the zero emissions end of the spectrum? And if these practices are not already being insisted upon, when do you believe that Leeds City Council will insist on these method methods being compulsory? 
Thanks very much for that. Concise and to the point. That's what I like. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be requesting um, the planning, chief planning officer, the plan service to provide a reply to those good, very good questions. Colleagues are okay with that? Yep. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, Council Flint, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, so sorry. I couldn't get in. Um, yeah, I'm Councillor Emma Flint for uh, Wheatwood Ward. Sorry, I'm late. That's quite all right. Thank you so much. Right. So let's move on to agenda item five, working groups update. Over to you, Polly. Okay, so last week we had two working group meetings. So we had the food and biodiversity working group where we had an update from the University of Leeds on their carbon decision making tool for menu planning. Um, and then we and we had some quite interesting discussion around that in terms of the use cases. And there was a lot of um, enthusiasm about finding different ways to use it beyond the original use of school mills across the city. And we could see a lot of potential and a lot of support. So the University of Leeds are looking at ways of how we can bring in further research funding to expand that. We also heard about community supported agriculture. Um, we had an example from Meanwood Farm. Where they talked about the specific detail. Foodwide Leeds also sort of talked more about the general concept as well as the CSA organisation themselves. Um, and there was some asks for us as a council in terms of our land mapping and land allocation and planning colleagues were also present and have taken that away to have a look at to see how we can support. Then I gave an update on our food action plan in terms of the net zero and um, referred to the food strategy that we're intending to bring in the autumn um, and the food event that we've got happening on Friday to start us off on that. Um, and also talked about the initial micro feasibility study that we have had done linking a greenhouse to our district heating network. So um, gave an initial in overview of that. The Transport and Behaviour Change Group also met um, and they discussed the government's proposal to tackle commonly littered single use plastic items um, and in, looked at it in, in consideration of our net zero, but also our statutory responsibility for littering. Um, we had a really constructive discussion again and the action taken away from that was to develop a formal response based on members' comments um, and to feed that feed a formal response from the working group into the national consultation that's ongoing at the moment. The planning and building working group is meeting in um, a couple of weeks' time and they will be looking at the draft energy strategy that will be going to Executive yep. Board in February. Um, and that's all the updates I've got for now. Thank you. Excellent. Have we got any questions or comments from uh, members on that? Nope. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just folks, a regular reminder that the working groups are open to all members of council. So if you could um, um, pass that back to you, your respective political groups, that the, everyone's most welcome to attend and they are. We cover a lot of ground. They're really interesting. And we want to bring in as much expertise from elected members as we can. Right. So close that item off then. So this item six then is our um, snappily titled Future Fashion Factory Update. So colleagues, if you remember, we've, we've been discussing consumption carbon and how, how to start to even begin to think about how to address that. And it's certainly a very, it's a, a huge agenda and it's one that's incredibly complicated, com complicated, that's not even a word, is it? Complicated. And so what we want to do today is kick things off with this really, really interesting project um, that's running. And we've got 60 minutes for this item. And during my chair's brief, I learned a lot in the space of about 10 minutes and it's quite eye-opening. And we've got an, a, a great bunch of contributors. So with all of that said, I will hand over to Gilda, who's going to take us through this item and all our great speakers. So over to you, Gilda. Thank you very much, Councillor Washer. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gilda Smithley, and I work um, as part of the economic policy team. Um, and Fiona, my line manager, is actually on the call, who is going to be speaking about something unrelated a little bit later. So we're all here. Lucky you all. Um, but yeah, so today um, it's with great pleasure that I'll be um, introducing you to the work of the Future Fashion Factory. Um, now, as a council, we've been involved with this work since its inception in 2018. Previous to that, we'd been working with um, Yorkshire Textiles, um, Susie Shepherd, who's on the call here with us, to, um, to keep abreast of what's happening in fashion and textiles industry. Um, I know often when people hear fashion and textiles, their eyes just glaze over like, what are we talking about these things for? 
But I think the good news is, is that having an understanding of how um, much income, number one, the fashion and textile um, industry brings not just to Yorkshire, but to the UK in general, how important it is in terms of the changes that it wants to make that can have a seriously huge impact on our, um, our carbon footprint and how the work that Future Fashion Factory really is contributing towards um, reducing and changing the way manufacturers um, produce and so on. So in terms of a, of a quick overview to introduce um, um, Professor Steve Russell, um, Susie Shepard and Sue Rinton, who are really leading on this project, um, I will hand over to them and they can explain to you what work they're doing in terms of changing our, our views on manufacturing around fashion and textiles and how the work that they're doing is really changing our new um, generation of designers and really upskilling the workforce as well. So I will be quiet and I will hand over to Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Gilda, and uh, good morning, everyone. Can you can you all hear me okay? Good, I like the thumbs and the nods, that's good. Um, so um, I, am, I do have a, a short presentation that I was intending to give. Um, although I'm an academic, I will keep it short, but you'll be pleased to know. And um, I, I'm gonna try and share my screen, so hopefully uh, it'll work okay. Thank you. Okay, can you see this? Oh, marvellous, right. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to take about um, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to um, just take you through uh, the Future Fashion Factory programme. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to say is, it is that I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training. So you might think, what am I doing working in the fashion industry? But what will soon become apparent is that the the textile and fashion industry is, is much more um, far-reaching than many of us often appreciate. And the impacts of the industry globally are enormous. And a lot of those impacts are, by, are being driven by, you, by the UK. We are the largest consumer of um, clothing and fashion in the whole of Europe. At roughly 27 kilograms uh, per year per person compared to 16.7 kilograms per person in Germany and nine in France. So a lot of the impacts that we create are experienced elsewhere in the world. Um, and there's a need for real solutions which we are generating in the future fashion factory. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what this national R&D center is, um, how we're working with our local industry to create global um, solutions and job opportunities for the industry and also enabling true circular economies too. So this means uh, new business opportunities that have really positive environmental and social benefits but fundamentally economically viable to carry out so that they can sustain themselves. I want to start off by just telling you something about the global impacts of this industry. They are enormous. <laughs> so through the materials we're using, through the way that we manufacture, and because of the magnitude of consumption of textiles and clothing, um, both in the UK and elsewhere in the world, we are a global, we're responsible for a large proportion of global carbon emissions as an industry. We use roughly 20% of, we, we create roughly 20% of global wastewater as well polluting the environment or otherwise having to be managed. And I think I heard someone mention earlier on uh, the problem of plastics. A very large proportion of those plastics are, are coming from washing machines and the fibre that goes through the, the, the waste into our watercourses and then into the sea. So fibres are a major cause of microplastic pollution. And then we have this enormous global industry shipping materials thousands of miles. Um, so we have almost a crazy situation where we might make a fabric in the UK and ship it to the Far East to be made into a finished product, only to be shipped back to be sold to a customer. So an enormous footprint there with transport linked emissions. 
And then I, I mentioned before the problem of overconsumption as well. So um, a, a lot of what is being produced never gets sold at full price. It gets discounted because it was made um, for stock and then in the hope that it could be sold later. And finally, uh, this industry is a major contributor to landfill uh, in, and incineration in the UK as well. So roughly 350,000 tonnes of textiles and clothing, most of which is recyclable. Because it gets put in the domestic bin, never gets recycled, it goes straight into incineration. So these are all just examples of the, of the impacts, uh, both uh, nationally and internationally. But the industry is also a major employer globally, but also in the UK. So these are just a few figures that give you a sense of, of, of how big the industry is in the UK. It's one of the UK's largest creative industries. Um, and all of those big companies that you've heard about as big retailers, uh, many of them are based in the UK. You know? um, so they are major contributors to, to the UK economy. And in, in this region, which is why we were selected to be um, the centre for, for this R&D activity. There's a real hotspot of design and manufacturing activity, as you can see in the map, in, in this region. So that, that's in Leeds and, and, and the surrounding Leeds city region. And um, the other very important part of the industry is a very long standing. Some of these companies are hundreds of years old. Um, they are textile mills supplying the biggest designer brands that that we know. So, you know, people like Burberry, of course, are a 2.6 billion pound business, which um, has a vertical manufacturing operation um, here in Yorkshire. Um, so their factory making raincoats is, is near Castleford, and then they weave the fabric um, out uh, near Keithley. Um, but all those other big brands are taking fabric from the Yorkshire region and then putting them into their luxury garments. So that's another very important part of what we do in this region. The Future Fashion Factory um, is, 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 as I've mentioned, uh, a national centre. It has over 450 company partners, including Burberry and big retailers, but also most of the small to medium sized enterprise manufacturing base in Yorkshire is involved, as well as many startup designers, new brands, new micro companies. And we're working in collaboration um, on now well over 50 projects to tackle, to, to, to innovate, to come up with ways of dealing with those emissions and environmental impact uh, challenges that I mentioned at the beginning. So these are practical, um, many of them science-based initiatives to resolve those issues. And, and those solutions, of course, have a global market. Uh, they're, they're created here in Leeds through the collaboration, but the market for those solutions is, is, is a global one. Um, so that is uh, able to drive uh, global interest and business into this region, which is what we're seeing. So I want to just go through a few examples now, just to try and make it a bit, uh, a, a little bit, um, more real, shall we say. Um, and I, I put up here a few themes. Um, about 60% of all the fibre that we consume in clothing is derived from oil. It's oil-based chemistry that we use to make fibre. And um, we've been, so fibres like polyester, nylon, are all derived from oil-based oil -based, non-renewable sources. And so uh, there's a major um, thrust trying to come up with ways of getting the physical properties and the fabrics to work properly without using that type of chemistry, switching to bio-based, naturally uh, renewable uh, resource chemistry. Um, so Chimera Fabrics is a, is a really big business in our region. Um, they make fabrics that go into our uh, railways, hotels, um, upholstered fabrics. And I think this is a theme that is, is really important when I go through this as well. Not only are we coming up with ways of reducing emissions, um, not using materials and manufacturing methods that consume um, non-renewable resources, 
but we're also trying to make it economically attractive to do it. So in this particular case, not only are we coming up with some new chemistry, but we're also reducing the amount of processing, manufacturing uh, requirements to, to, to make the final fabric, reducing cost. And another example, Saltico, um, we found certain species of, of plant that will grow in brackish water. So this is water that's saline, that isn't really normally suitable for growing crops and growing um, crops that yield fibre inside them. So we, we grow the crop, we strip the fibre out of the stems of the crop. It's a very similar way to the way that flax that makes linen is, 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 is grown. But we're doing that in, in the UK to create a new UK supply chain. And that fibre is now um, being trialled by some of, some of the country's biggest retail brands as an alternative to synthetic down effectively in, in outdoor jackets and that sort of thing. Um, so that's a, a brand new material essentially that has been created here um, to be consumed in the UK, hopefully uh, to reduce demand for synthetic fiber. Another important element of our work is, is, to, is to close the loop. You know, so instead of taking, making and disposing, which is what industry has done for many years, which isn't sustainable. We're trying to make sure that the waste that industry produces becomes a new raw material. Um, so this is just one example of many that we're working on, uh, converting synthetic fiber from swimwear back into a raw material that can be made back into that same type of garment. So closing the loop and keeping that fiber circulating for years and years and years without discarding it and disposing of it. And again, to do that, we, we're coming up with new ways of sorting the material. So you know you've got fiber A, fiber B, not, not a mix of lots of unknown materials. And new, new recycling technology, mechanical and chemical recycling technology um, that we can operationalize um, in our region and elsewhere in the UK. Another very important area of development, which surprises many, is the, the move to digital um, fashion. So when we, I, I'm too old to do this now, but when, when, when people play computer games and you've seen those avatars and you, you, you can click and decide what, what way you want to be dressed, that is another business opportunity for the industry. And we've got companies like Lockwood, uh, Lockwood Publishing based in, in, in this region, in this city, who have millions of subscribers to this type of service, providing what are effectively digital skins for avatars, um, for, for games and, and also for movies as well. A lot of what you see in movies aren't really dressed uh, people or artifacts, they're, they're digitally dressed. But those digital representations need to be incredibly convincing and accurate when they're moving um, for them to be acceptable. So we've got some real cutting edge work going on in that area as well. And of course, if you're, selling, if you're a company based in Leeds and you're selling your products uh, globally, the worst thing you can do is make it first and send it in a parcel to your customer in the US or, or wherever for them to say, I, I don't like it, send me another sample. But if you can communicate digitally with incredibly accurate simulations of that, of that product, before it's even been manufactured, not only are you saving loads of resource, but you're also decision-making a lot more quickly and making your business more agile. So this, you know, whether it's B2B, you know, company to company or direct to the consumer, D to C, you know, so much clothing that's bought online is returned, so wasteful. Many companies don't resell that clothing. The consumer sends it back as if it's just trivial material. The amount of resource that's embodied in that garment being sent back to the retailer because it's the wrong color or doesn't fit properly is enormously wasteful. So, you know, if, if that transaction could take place digitally before that garment is sent or made, again, huge amounts of savings in terms of uh, the resources and the emissions associated with activity. Another very important um, 
part of what we're looking at uh, is to, to only manufacture what's needed on demand. So instead of manufacturing for stock, um, hoping that it, someone will buy it and ending up having to discount 50% of it later because it doesn't sell at the price you intended, making, making only what's needed when it's needed at, on a scale that's relevant. And this is a new service that we've launched in a local company, um, AW Hainsworth, that also makes the fabric accessible to startup designers because the minimum order quantity is much lower. So there isn't such a, uh, uh, a difficulty raising enough money to be able to buy the fabric you need to get your um, products designed and, and, and retailed. So not only is it saving waste, it's also enabling new business opportunities to, to come from it too. And finally, I wanted to mention a very large project that is that we're leading at the university involving IBM. I don't need to explain to you who IBM um, are, of course, an enormous uh, company in the digi digital technology area, and also the UK Fashion and Textile um, Association based in London that represents the whole industry, including our own up here in Yorkshire. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in this industry is knowing where your fibre and fabric um, has come from and whether it's been pr produced ethically. People have been play paid properly and treated correctly, um, haven't been any dodgy subcontracts going on, um, that, you that you can have complete trust in what you're buying. Um, rather like uh, we have trust, hopefully, in the food that we buy. So a very similar system where we, we're developing new technology that allow, allows immutable, non you can't amend it, a completely accurate track and trace of the fiber that's grown in the field or made by the factory through to the yarn that is spun, through to the fabric that's woven or knitted, through to the manufacturer of the clothing gut or item itself, and then to retail. So that whole journey is digitally tracked and traced in a way that cannot be corrupted. Uh, is it, that's what this software and, and the technology that goes around it is doing. So clearly, what's great about that is it will be a brand new resource made here in Leeds, but with a global audience, national and global audience. So already some of the, some of the world's biggest retailers are evaluating that technology to serve their own needs, including H&M uh, and our own Next, of course, which is headquartered in the UK. So that's all I wanted to say. I promise not to uh, PowerPoint you to death at the beginning. I hope I haven't done. Um, but I also hope that gives you a little bit of an insight into uh, the breadth and uh, influence of this industry on global emissions and surrounding and associated um, environmental and social impacts. Thank you very much, everyone. No, thank you. That was that was incredibly interesting. As I said, colleagues at the towards the start of the meeting, it's <laughs> learning a lot through looking at this area. So, got a couple of people wanting to to speak already. I know um, Professor Russell's got um, colleagues in attendance as well. So, if people want to, if Susie and Co want to make contributions, obviously just just indicate as well. But in terms of um, we've got Councillor Buckley, Councillor Hayden, and then Councillor Forsyth. So over to you, Neil. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and as ever, uh, really interesting, very, very yeah. interesting presentation. Um, some things we thought we knew and other things that uh, we probably didn't know in my case. But I, I just had several questions, really, and maybe the odd observation. Um, and just starting from the beginning, if you like, from when Professor Russell started his presentation, he seemed to be saying that um, in the United Kingdom, we're consuming three times as many garments as France. And um, that surprised me. So I just wonder whether he could just uh, clarify that. Um, we're a very similar sized country and um, the French have not struck me as being particularly scruffy to put it mildly. Um, so I just wonder whether he could, uh, whether he could do that. Um, there was a lot of, um, of the word we in the presentation and it's sometimes interesting that uh, who is this we because 
Um, he, he explained about um, goods being shipped across the world for various processes and being brought back and all the rest of it. And it, it, it's funny, isn't it? Ten years ago, people said, oh, globalisation is the way we're all going to get better off and this is the way to go. And this is what globalisation is. And things have changed a little bit. Um, the, the item about goods shouldn't be made for stock. Um, and I thought, well, if you speak to marketing people or production people or sales people, I used to be in sales. And um, the worst thing on earth is somebody giving you an order and then uh, the office saying, oh, we've no stock. And so it goes to your competitor who does have stock. Because in the real world, people do want it there and then, don't they? They want to walk into Primark and Next and Marks and & Spencer and buy it there and then. They don't want to order it, do they? Um, or even if they order it online, they want it to come that week. Um, and luxury products, um, things that cotton things, which Lancashire used to make, and woolen things, which Yorkshire used to make. Um, and, and high quality garments with uh, including consideration with uh, ethical points and, uh, and trust and that kind of thing. That's great. I mean, I'm all in favor of this, but I can afford it. I can afford to buy these things. But I'm just wondering people who need to buy t-shirts at 4.99, we all know they're made in Bangladesh and they're made of strange materials which come from oil. Um, you know, I'll leave it there for the moment, uh, yep. Sean. I think there were one or two questions that were be answered. There were. Um... Shall I answer those quickly now? Yeah. yeah. So, right, so very, very quickly, um, just regarding, I was writing as quickly uh, as the council was talking, so hopefully I've, ca I've caught everything. Um, so the first thing regarding France, one of the biggest factors in the UK is fast fashion. So it's the driving of cheap fashion, um, that's essentially why the UK is such a large consumer um, uh, compared to other countries where that fast fashion appetite is so strong. In, in terms of who is we, well, the whole initiative is a collaborative R&D initiative. So these are industry-led projects where industry defines its need. And then we, as the academic team working together with them, harness uh, our expertise to deliver uh, solutions to their problems. So it's not about us as academics saying, you know, we're the clever ones, we'll tell you what to do. They give us the boundary conditions and the, and the challenges that they have struggled to develop a solution for and we work with them to, to do it. So that, that's where we comes from. And there are, uh, there are 450 companies in the, in the uh, organization at the moment. With regard to the stock question, you know, I totally agree. You know, the worst thing you could do is not have any stock and then rely on a business that has to supply quickly. But this comes to a very important point about the way we the way we design and manufacture. So that you know, the traditional way of designing and manufacture wasn't agile, and and it wasn't possible to design and make within the same week because. The, you know, the networks were, were, were so long and the lead times were so long as well. So what, what, what is going on, um, what is starting to happen is this idea of smart, digitally connected, locally distributed factories where, where um, an order comes in, it's manufactured on design, uh, on demand, even just a few garments or one garment for an individual customer and then shipped within the same week. So it's, this is a completely different way of thinking about the way that we manufacture. And of course, the, the real benefit for us is that it, it gives us an opportunity to shorten our supply chains and bring a different type of manufacturing uh, back into the UK. So th that's something that quite a few companies are actively looking at because it's a business opportunity and means they can respond quickly. And just with regard to the track and trace question being only perhaps relevant to uh, expensive luxury garments. Again, the main, uh, the main reason for the, the main concern uh, 
around global supply chains and in the fashion industry is exactly for those cheap, low cost products to make sure that they're not cheap and low cost because people are being treated um, wrongly. Or, or we've got child labor involved and, and so on, or dark factories. So that it is exactly that part of the supply chain that, that we're trying to sort out because it, it, it is a major concern to, to big retailers. So it, it's not expensive only, it's, it's actually uh, mainly the opposite. So I, I hope that helps a little bit. It, it really does. And I think what we're touching upon really is, is an attitudinal shift, which is a key objective for us really, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, that's a mammoth task. I'm very, very intrigued by the sort of, if you, the, the social, cultural, economic differences between France, Germany and ourselves. And, and, and how, why does that manifest in those different consumption patterns? That's a really interesting one. But looking at the UK, getting an attitudinal shift by consumers away from um, that, that very high level of clothes consumption, that is a lot of kilograms per person per year. And obviously that would be very, very differentiated. But I'm sorry? May I just come back very briefly? Yeah, of course you can, Neil. Just a quick one, really. Just on the comment about uh, individual products being made for, in other words, a garment, for example, made for a customer and then sent to her or him. The costs of that are astronomic, aren't they? Um, I mean, if you're making 5,000 of one item for stock, which will be sold over a given period that you've worked out is more economic, just making one garment per person and sending it must cost four times the price, surely. It could well be that the, the technological change that Professor Russell has highlighted is, is actually drive, is changing the economic parameters. You know. so, so just very quickly on that one. Yeah, sure. Some of you, some of you will be familiar with inkjet printing, uh, right? So uh, in the food industry, they inkjet print patterns onto, uh, I think I saw... You know, those stickles that you can buy in bags, right? Those, those sweets. So you can upload an image and it will, the machine during production will inkjet print whatever image onto that uh, packaging, but even onto the individual stickle. And the, the, the cost of doing that um, isn't you know, anywhere near as significant as it might seem because it's a digitally driven process. It's not driven by people and hands, it's driven by, by switching over of a digital system that's running continuously. So, it's still five times the still five times the cost of conventional printing, however. It, yes, so th th there is there are cost implications for sure. I'm, I'm not trying to say that there aren't, but but the point is that that combination of agility, speed, mm -hmm. and making on demand rather than making hundreds of thousands of the same mm. item is a, is a progressive process, which is. Uh, starting to take hold in some parts of the industry because it's seen as an opportunity. That is a fascinating avenue of inquiry. I mean, I would imagine right in saying that it's actually fairly early days with regard to that, that approach. So, you know, once you've, once you've cracked the basic science, it's just a matter of refining the engineering, isn't it? Really, effectively, that's how industrial processes tend to evolve. Right, Councillor Hayden. Sorry um, for interjecting. Councillor Walsh, oh. I apologise for... Just um, right. just to go back to some a question that um that that Councillor Buckley um had a little bit earlier around the cheaper garments, um and I'm I totally take on board what you're saying in terms of not everyone is going to be able to afford a certain type of garment, um and Councillor Walsh, you said something about that shift in attitude, and I think that's something that um um Professor Russell has also um alluded to we have to change our attitude. If we still want to be buying very cheap clothing for every event that we go to, then there is a there is an implication to that, not just financially, but also climate wise. And I think um, it's around and it's slightly, slightly um, off topic in terms of what we're dealing with now for Future Fashion Factory. But it's also changing our attitudes towards things like how we view charity shops and, um, and recycling clothing and mending clothing and shoes and all of these things. But that's something that we have to, um, we have to change people's attitudes about very much 
similar to things like how people recycle now. You know, everybody, well, I wouldn't say everybody recycles, but most of us are aware of why we should recycle and why it's good for our environment. So I think it's it's moving slightly towards some of those conversations. Um, and that's probably for a different time. But I do think, and I, and I do consider, take into consideration what you were saying about not everybody being able to afford certain things, but we can actually afford things in a different way if we go a different route. Thank you and apologies for interjecting there. No, not at all, Gilda. That was really useful. Um, Kelsey Hayden. Hi. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you, Gilda, because um, I did notice that you had your hand up, so I was going to um, <laughs> bring you in. But you've, you've mentioned exactly what um, one of the things I was I was going to talk about because in, in the presentation, and maybe it um, it did mention, maybe I'm going off topic, but. And I, I think that younger people are changing their attitudes. So apparently I'm an excellent Vinti, um, but I use a Vinted website and I've used eBay for a while, but Vinted, Vinted is a, a really about um, fashion primarily and children's clothes. And you will get clothes that have still got labels on. You can search for clothes mm. that still got labels on. It's it's incredible. And the, the savings that you have, but also the fact that you're reusing um, and recycling that fashion, but I've I um, I wore the red jacket on on Wednesday that I got off vintage, and um, you know, um, and it does make you you get a whole new wardrobe because I love clothes, but I and um, and I love fashion, and you might not be able to tell me now. And I've got our garments from 10, 15 years ago, twenty years ago, my denim jacket for twenty years ago. At the moment, they don't all fit me properly, and that's one. <laughs> <laughs> with um, long fashion but um that's one especially after the last couple of years of covid and being too near to the fridge <laughs> but um it's um but i i still hang on to them <laughs> um and with certain items anyway but i think we have to have that that cultural shift i think it is happening with the you know, because my generation shopping is a, a social occasion you know or has been and getting a new outfit for every single like you said, every single event that you're going to, not being seen, seen in the same thing twice. I never come to them, but I know that lots of people who did, and uh, and it's not necessarily their fault. Um, their fault. It's a way that we've been. So my ambition is to get a French capsule wardrobe, and that that'll be why, because the French do do a capsule wardrobe instead of having loads of different um, items of clothing. They'll mix and match um, different things together. So there's lots on um, the internet about you know putting yourself together a French capsule wardrobe. On the issue about the um, the global, I mean, it, it brought um, it kind of manufacturing process. It brought to mind to me, Mahatma Gandhi, and when he told his uh, told Indians to start spinning their own cloth because they would send the cotton to Manchester and uh, and then he realised the implications for the mills in Man Manchester, so sent his representative to go and speak go and speak to them. So this has been, you know, a long time thing where we have grown, you know, things in manufacturing, in other words, and then sent them back to be consumed in in uh, countries where other where they've been manufactured. Um, and I don't want people in Bangladesh to not have a job because we've decided to, you know, um, <laughs> weave our own yarn and things like that. But it has to be and, and like you were saying with the um, new digital way and definitely ethically driven and um, definitely kind of you know, child labour and all that sort of thing. But I want them to have good, decent jobs. And I, so I don't mind if it comes from Bangladesh as long as everything's been taken to bad, make it ethically, but also mm. reduce that carbon thing as much as possible. I've gone on far too long, but really, really interesting. And I've been wanting for a while for us to talk about clothes because... Yeah. It is a really important issue. Thank you. Could I okay. can I be heard actually? Susie Shepherd here. I'm ghost like. Can I be heard but not seen at the moment? You can be heard, Susie, yes, so far away. Oh great. I was just going to say, um, on those points that were raised then, I think the the attitude that's being now, thank goodness, influenced from the top end of the luxury, these things felt filter down. You know, mm. young girls may lust for a Gucci something, so they'll have a cheap imitation of that, wear it for a Saturday, get it online, get it delivered. 
the carbon footprint enormous, throw it in the bin, even worse. But I think what's happening now, because the uh, top end of all these luxury labels, are they're aware their customers are not going to want to buy into a lot of their stuff um, if it's not ethical, if it's, you know, there's a whole list of things. Is it biodegradable? Can it be go to the second-hand market? Those labels often do. Um, and they have then a rental market as well. It is filtering down. And I think for young people, I'd just like to say in praise of, of the younger generation is that there is a definite turn away. There is, as Councillor Hayden said, there's a return to vintage even vintage things have to have a quality to survive and otherwise they'd just be, you know, moth-eaten rags or something. People are repairing, people are upcycling. But from all those things in themselves, new businesses are coming. So it's not it, – it's a, it's a change in the way we're going and hopefully it will carry on for the better. But giving a fair price for the right product is about people understanding – what is that product worth and what's it cost the environment what's mm. it cost the slave trade or whatever it is and like the ibm project people are engaging with that i'm not saying everyone can at every minute of the day mm. um, but it is a definite change in in the years that i've worked around textiles and fashion yeah i can quite really clearly see it now the way things are changing in a good way but it all needs for example the shoddy we all know what you're in yorkshire what shoddy is but that's something that's becoming actually a sought after commodity it's um recycling of luxury fibers if you like particularly biodegradable such as wool um that's becoming um we have someone in leeds we, ha we have a lot of things around that as well as new fibers so the way the product's made how it's made in terms of efficiency are you wasting it because um, the standard still to some extent today is that people actually order one of the big houses. Obviously, we all know our mills supply all the international fashion brands because we're no, so known for it here. But they'll be all people will order samples. Can you make me this to look like that? Can you? Make, and then they'll do that to all the mills. All that has to get sent out. Most of them then don't use it because they're using something else that season or they go back to a different mill. That's something where there's a huge scope for jobs as well digitally in mm. the that stage of the industry because we're trying to discuss today, we'll come back again, I can be seen, um, but we're trying to discuss what is a vast stream from raw product right through to all the manufacturing, finishing, the weaving, whatever's going on, and to the end of it comes a product to how that's retailed, how that, how people react with that product, if they connect to it, it's personalised, they'll keep it and wear it longer. And then after that, post-life. So that's upcycling, mm. or repairing, or can it be reprocessed? And it's quite hard to, I think, Steve will know, to cover the... the huge breadth of this subject um, so briefly and FFF obviously as Steve said we're responding to industry here what do mm. they need so it's not about this would be a great idea go and try it FFS be unusual excellent no thanks Susie that's, yeah that's, that's really helpful set of comments um, Council Forsyth uh, thank you very much Chair and um, Thank you to uh, Steve for your presentation, for Gil and Susie all coming along. Um, this morning, first thing on a Monday morning, this is music to my ears. Um, <laughs> I feel so encouraged by this and the beginning of this new year as well. So thank you very much. So can I, I just wanted to make a comment about a few things, really. Um, first of all, to highlight your use of the word enabling a circular economy. This has just got to be the, the way forward, really. Um, so I just wanted to re reiterate that, really. Um, uh, I'll come back to us in a minute as well. Can I also just, um, this is partly as well from what Susie was just saying, using the different words about upcycling and things. I think we need to unpack the, or, or, or clarify our use of the word recycling, because I think we need to get reducing and reusing and renewing into our vocabulary rather than just the sort of recycling they are they're quite mm. different um thank you as well about salty coat that's some research for me about these plants were um in brackish water i had not heard of that um 
despite knowing a reasonable amount about the sort of environmental things. Um, the ethical production of textiles, this is really important. And I mean, I hear what um, has been said about producing, you know, Bangladesh producing textiles and that be so important. But countries like Bangladesh and other such countries are going to be the ones that are probably going to be most affected by the climate emergency anyway. So we've just got to do our part, just adding that really. Um, uh, a couple of other things. Are you doing anything in all of your work about washing our items, how they're washed? Mm -hmm. You know, as I did actually, you know, so the, the, the wool items that we wear over the winter, they, you, can't, you can't be washing those quite so frequently. So that's, that's just a question really, because that's also about the microfibers. Um, just coming back then, just to finish off really, um, this is about sharing, um, about shifting attitudes. It's about value as well. It's about us valuing yes. what we have and what we own. That's so, yes. so crucial. Hopefully, you know, I do think that the climate, that the, the COVID emergency we've had has got people reflecting on what really is important. And mm. I think we need to go into that debate. And finally, just finally, the, S, the SMEs you talk about that are doing so much of this work, Surely this is, we need to be thinking about, we've got a group, that, uh, uh, sorry, a SEAC group that is talking about finance. We should be thinking about investing in these local firms that are doing this work. So that was just another, another thought as well. Sorry, there's lots of points there and I hope I kept it mm -hmm. as short as I might possibly do. Thank you. There was, thanks, Council Officer. I mean, did we want to pick up some of the points that Anne raised? Um, I can just very briefly uh, thank you very sure. much. Thank you very much for, for for those questions. I think two things with regard to uh, washing. So one of the one of the projects that we do have going on is quite a large project at the moment, which is um, I think funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, is about designing garments, engineering garments, so that they don't release microfiber, don't release those fibers during washing. Right, so there are, two, there are two considerations there. There, there, there is um, uh, how frequently you wash and therefore how much you expose uh, the, the, the water that comes out of the washing machine um, to, to uh, contamination with fibre. But the other element, which I think is really fundamental, is the engineering design of the fabric itself. Mm. So we've got work going on now looking at uh, building fabrics that are much more resistant to shedding effectively those microfibers, those fibers from the garment. The other angle is the chemistry that we use to wash our garments is, is also influential in terms of um, the um, longevity of our clothing and also therefore how long we're likely to use it before we decide we don't want it anymore because it's faded or it's lost its shape or, or it's starting to you know, look threadbare. So that's another area where we can see linkage and, and where we're doing uh, work with the industry on, on, the, on the formulations that uh, are used to, um, to, to actually wash our clothes alongside um, the water. So those are just two areas which I, I hope address the questions. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it, it is such a, uh, <laughs> a very, very, very large area of, uh, of work here that we're touching upon today. Um, Councillor Anderson, you're next, then Councillor Garthwaite. Yeah, the first one is actually probably aimed more at the council officers present in the call. Sure. That is the, i.e. the council's waste strategy. As someone who is currently uh, doing a scrutiny inquiry into that, I can tell you categorically that it doesn't even register on any plans for the waste strategy. So maybe we need to get that looked at as a matter of urgency that we need to get uh, through to the senior management there that they need to be doing something about it because it's not even on the waste strategy. And in fact, the view of the management in waste strategy is that they won't do anything until the government have decided what they're going to do. Well, 
I would argue that if we are going to lead by example as a city, then we've got to start putting in place recycling facilities uh, for, uh, or I actually agree with Council, what Councillor Forsyth said, we've got to, you know, reuse, etc. We've got to get this in now, because if you go out to our incinerator, mm. they have a massive problems with clothes clogging up their machinery because the number of people who just put them straight into the black bin and then mm. it goes through. So it's it's important on that one. So we do need to do something about it now. The next questions are more general, not specifically for officers, but can someone, not today, <laughs> get sent through to us the volume of job transfers that they see would need to be uh, accommodated? So in other words, jobs in Bangladesh would need to be transferred to this country. Uh, so how many jobs are we talking about? Because if, if you're going to source it as close to the consumer as possible, that means you're going to have to take jobs away from the Indian, Indian subcontinent and put them at least in Europe and preferably in this country so that we can reduce our footprint. What would be the economic impact of this? Because some of these major companies make quite nice profits, shall I say. And uh, if you take something, I, mean, I know we're talking about fashion items, but if we take watches, look how many knockoff watches there are. You know, the major manufacturers find that their watches get knocked off. So people, you know, if you're going to print them, what I'm saying is if you're going to print them using 3D printing, uh, there is a greater chance that you're going to have more knockoffs. So uh, you, it's how you're going to manage that particular thing. And then, and I think it was Councillor Buckley that first brought it up, economies of scale. If you're only producing just-in-time management, as an accountant, I can assure you that is a recipe for absolute disaster, just-in-time management. Because if anything goes wrong with your production line, it totally uh, causes problems. So you need to always have a degree of stock. That's why companies that go for that type of thing run a bit close to the wind in, ten in terms of their management if they start running that close because they are very dependent on materials coming in. So the first one is, uh, is targeted at the council officers yeah. and the other three, I'm not expecting an answer to them, but can we get papers to us showing how many jobs would need to be transferred, what would be the economic impact on this country and, more importantly, this city? Because we as the SEAC are only interested in what we can do uh, locally. What happens outside is for other people to, to deal with, not with us. We need to do look what we're doing here. And finally, the economies of scale. So that if we were talking to people like the market traders, what would the market traders' view be? If they had, if they couldn't stock things up, yeah. and how they get a hold of, because Leeds Kirgit Market, are we going to throw them to the wolves as well in terms of not necessarily being able to get access to materials, or are they all going to be given a printer that they can print in the back of their their stall uh, things? Let's think about some of these things before we actually uh, deliver on them. Thanks, Darren Anderson. Well, I mean, just just to say, I mean, au contraire, and we're only thinking about lead, things in Leeds. We want both our council, our city, and in this committee to have as as broad and as wide an impact as possible. You know, we want to be a, a an exemplar city for all of these agendas. So I think that's how we have influence. Um, but it, Polly, did you want to come in on a couple of those points? But so specifically around the the waste strategy. So yeah, I think please. the waste strategy when it was developed a few years back it it did have at its heart about the kind of reduce and the sort of waste hierarchy um, yeah. and you know councillor anson's right in the sense that we are waiting to see what the national waste strategy says because of some of the funding but that's more linked probably to food i would say than textiles yeah. um, and i think at the scrutiny report we did flag actually the difference between you know what the, the textiles going to the incinerator versus reducing versus recycling 
Um, and one of the key areas, I think the two key ones that we flagged that we really wanted to target were textiles and the other yep. one was the um, like electrical equipment because those yep. are the two that actually you can have the biggest impact by diverting before they get anywhere near the waste cycle. Um, so there is work going on. Um, there is definitely more work to do on that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny that. Um, yep. But I've been asked to get more involved with that to make sure that we are looking at that carbon impact. So there you know they're traveling in the right direction i think is probably where we have to set, leave it for now can i just can I just confirm yeah. that Polly is correct she did highlight it the problem is other council departments don't necessarily are on board with this climate ag agenda that's what i'm getting at is that yes Polly is leading brilliantly in this but it's getting other council departments to buy in that's where my concern, it's not Polly's work, it's the other council departments buying in. Yeah, and I'd just say that, you know, as I was asked by Tom to get involved in it and to work alongside people like John and things. So I think there is that senior leadership to, to make yeah. sure that climate is part of the waste strategy. So, um, yeah, we will we'll do what we can to make sure we influence that. Thanks so much, Polly. Um, Councillor Carlisle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've just got to respond to an emergency phone call from a constituent. Would you mind off me taking the chair for 10 minutes? If that's yeah. okay. Sorry about this, Peter. Um, and then it's Councillor Garthwaite, then Councillor Flint next to come in. But I just need, it's, 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 it's a bit of casework and I just need to respond to a call. If that's okay, colleagues, sorry about this. But okay, Councillor sure. Callum? Okay, I'll, if nobody minds, I won't bother with running a vote to take over because we're assuming Neil back in 10 minutes and all I'm going to do is call the hands out in order. So, uh, Councillor Garthwaite. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I apologise for joining this meeting late and missing the first part of this very fascinating presentation. I was in another meeting and please stop me if I'm saying things that making points that have already been made. Um, but one thing that, two points, one is that although young people, some young people are changing their ways as regards clothes, I know from having organised donations from students at the time of students leaving Leeds at the end of their studies or changing their premise, their um, private rents, rented promises, um, that a lot of, and they donate clothes into bags that we provide for resale in free shops around the city. Now, I know that there are a great many clothes that were bought at very low cost, some of which still have their labels on. They're completely unworn. Um, and some of them have probably been worn maybe once. Mm. And there is still enormous wastage. And these are students, they're not, necess they're not people who are so poor that that's the only thing they can do they are buying in quantity and i know that the university is having some um campaigns against this and pointing out the waste and so on it is still going on and um there are a lot of pressures i think on young women and on um, girls to have the latest fashions and to look smart at all times and so on it's all connected with that sort of image that they want to portray. And I don't want to be in a blame game here at all, but I'm just saying it is happening. It's still happening and it does need confronting. Otherwise it will carry on. Um, another point entirely, for a long time, I've been a member of the board of Home Workers Worldwide. And this is a UK based um, NGO which works to support home workers around the world in their st struggle for rights and recognition and supports grassroots organizing and campaigns for countries to, to companies to improve conditions for home workers in their supply chains and lobbies for rec regulation. And in many countries, home workers are at the bottom of the supply chain. People know about factories in Bangladesh, they know perhaps less about women in India who are stitching in their own homes. And the conditions, despite the um, despite various regulations, are often very poor indeed. Um, there's a report that I'll circulate to everybody if you'd be interested, Stitching Our Shoes, 
home workers in South India. And this is illuminating in terms of the conditions for home workers, particularly in a, a city called Ambur. Um, home workers will be given a collection of uppers such as that, which they then stitch often by hand. So their hands become very swollen and it takes them quite a long time. Um, just briefly, there's one home worker speak, quoted here. I wake up at six or seven. I can't, um, I can't wake up early, i.e. 4 a.m. when the stuff arrives. So sometimes I work late at night. When I do so, I can't work the next day. My fingers are swollen. After I complete a pair, it takes about an hour for my hands to return to their normal conditions. So I don't, don't take on any urgent work. I finish work by 11 p.m. And these women are getting maybe 10 pence per pair for a pair of shoes that are sold in this country for 40 or 50 pounds. It's, um, they might go then to Bulgaria to be finished. They might go to Germany to be packed. Um, I think I came in when you were talking about the, the, the fashion going around the world and this happens. And then companies in this country write their, write their publicity material in such a way that you would think that everything was produced in this country, whereas things might just be finished or packaged in this country. Um, it's unhealthy work. Now, we don't want to say home workers should not be employed because for many women, this is their only way that they can get livelihood for the entire family. And they are saying there should be proper conditions for them. And so uh, campaigns like Labour, be Labour Behind the Label, which is part of the Clean Clothes campaign, or there is a specific organisation, Change Your Shoes, a partnership of 15 European and three Asian organisations, believing that workers in the shoe supply chain have a right to a living wage and safe working conditions. So there are NGOs, there, there, trade unions are involved, but it is... They are part of the supply chain. And as I say, the answer is not to say that shouldn't happen, but to say they should get decent working conditions um, as their options for work, earning a living are limited. Homework may be the only possibility that they have to generate income. So um, what I'd like to do is circulate this among everyone here at this meeting and recommend finding out more through the um, websites of the organisations I've, I've mentioned. And this is a key part of um, adding the environment side to it as well, just shows the importance of the whole thing, that the whole things are completely interlinked and the organisations mentioned are aware of the environmental cost as well. Thank you. Thanks, Al. I don't, I don't know if anyone wants to comment back on any of the points there. I think a lot of that was for for our reference and for information, really, we're adding information to the to the debate there. I don't know if anyone wants to comment back. Um, not seeing any indications there, but we'll come in. I'll, I'll carry, uh, Neil, was it on this particular point? I'll bring you in on that and then we'll carry on where we're going. Yeah, um, thanks, Peter. And um, yeah, a lot of this stuff is, is, is self-evidently the case. Nobody wants to see people in those kind of working conditions. And the point that Councillor Garthwaite made about manufacturers saying, oh, well, this is made in England, for example. And when you actually delve into it, it, it really isn't. I think that's a, that's a fair point. The problem comes with trying to enforce all this stuff. But, but the problem I was, um, the, the fundamental thing about all this is that let's just say a product is made partly by workers in those conditions. All these things are being fed into the market. And you can buy shoes for 30 quid or for 200 pounds, and they're, they're in different markets. And the ones costing 200 pounds are probably made in Northampton or somewhere like that. Historically, they certainly were mainly made there. But it's, it's the market. And poorer people will buy, will buy cheaper cheaper goods sorry sorry about that um typically uh, because because they have to they've got no choice 
Um, so I would just say that we've got to be careful because yes, we want to make these things better, but prices will rise. Thank, thanks, Peter. <laughs> Very valid point, Neil, and I think uh, Al referred to that in some of hers. I think we all know that there's no short fix if we all stop buying products that are uh, produced in this way, then suddenly you lead um, poorer communities without any of the jobs they rely on. Um, it, it's those works around um, uh, child labour as well. If you suddenly remove all child labour, then... Uh, without any kind of plan to go through, then you leave families without enough money to to live on. So you could end up creating a worse problem than you cause. But I think whether or not we should just leave it to the market, it's almost like you could say that the free market doesn't necessarily um, work in, in, in the way that it should, because we've got into this situation. Um, that There is probably a way of making things of a similar cost if we focus entirely on that, rather than focus on allowing uh, the rest of it to to resume as as planned and um, i'll bring in emma then i'll see that yeah that the chair has returned so I'll, I'll leave you to take over after emma thank you um i think most of my questions have been covered which is about the waste strategy and then um al talked about the student clear out it was really shocking like left bank which is a huge church was absolutely filled with um you know stuff that was thrown away mainly clothes some still with the labels on. So I think there's, although there's a lot of um, people's thinking changing about how we should, you know, reuse and um, buy secondhand clothes, there's, it, there's such a big culture to change. And um, I've got two teenage girls, so um, we talk about clothes a lot. <laughs> In my house, and my 17-year-old is, is now wearing all my 90s jeans that I had at university. <laughs> <laughs> So it's funny, but um, they were really impacted by a programme that Stacey Dooley did about um, fast fashion. And um, yeah, it's just important to note like who who influences like youth culture and um, and it's really important to use celebrities. I think I tried to show them a programme that Hugh Fernley Whittensall had done about fast fashion. They weren't particularly interested, but as soon as Stacey Dooley starts talking about it, they're interested. So, um, yeah. but, and you know, it is really shocking and uh, like we need to kind of use those people that can highlight the issue and that have the platform a lot more. Um, you know, they remember like things like um, seven tons of clothes are thrown away every minute and the average um, garment is worn seven times in the UK by people like, and there's actually been a campaign to try and get people to sign up to a 30 times pledge, which I think is still like incredibly low. Like, I find t-shirts in my husband's um, cupboard still from CNA, which like hasn't existed for <laughs> years. So like, you know, how, it's worth thinking about how many times do we like wear our items. And these are the kind of things we can talk about that might make um, people think. We just need to like kind of try and get people to take responsibility for what they're doing and maybe the consequences. Like people don't really think through the consequences because it's so easy to buy clothes. But yeah. the, the water waste thing is, is another really thing that we rarely think about clothes. So one pair of jeans takes up to 10,000 litres of water to make by the time it's processed and the dye. So, you know, we need to kind of think about the questions that we're asking people that aren't necessarily judgmental, but just maybe things people haven't thought about. Um, and another thing that could become um, part of just kind of everyday shopping. Um, H&M have a, a recycling box in their shop um, that if you've got clothes that you've worn out of, you put them in the box in that shop if you're buying another one. And it's obviously not solving all the problems, but it's just more normalising the fact that you don't throw something away. And we need to provide as many opportunities as possible for people to pass on their clothes, um, be it charity shops, be it, you know, vintage shops, be it hand-me-downs through your family, whatever. We just need to normalise the fact that you don't throw things away. And I yeah. thought what H&M was doing was good thing. No, uh, th thanks, Emma. Yeah, I, in contrast, I've, I've got three boys and just just getting them to wear 
uh, t-shirts and joggers is a bit of a victory, to be honest, <laughs> especially just over the last two years. But it's interesting our attitudes are changing. For how that in your example of your girls, I think that's really interesting. I think, guys, we've got about another ten minutes on this item. Um, I've got Councillor Hartbrook and then Councillor Ray. So Conrad, this is a bleak way of saying be reasonably concise. I will be concise. A um, few, 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 few quick points. I think it's been a really fascinating discussion. I think we need to drill down into what, how we as a council uh, do do something with this. I think the circular economy thing, because I'm obviously working in packaging, um, the circular economy is there. It's great. It's basically you make, you use, you collect, maybe wash mm. and reuse or recycle. Clothing is so much more complex because there is the whole secondary market, there's what you do with the tech, you know, there's things you can do with cloth, you can do things you can do with textiles. But yeah, so there's a lot of different outlets. And I think that ultimately, I think that the, the core truth that pervades this conversation is we've allowed the value to be taken out of clothing. It's, mm. seen, as a, it's, seen, it's seen in the same way as a, a disposable coffee stirrer in too many, yeah. in too many sectors of the economy. And, that, and that's kind of wrong, you know, but I'm, Wearing my North Face fleece that I met that I still wear, that, and I had it when I met my wife it's too many years ago. Um, <laughs> you know, it's there will have been some microfibers come off it over those years, but not too many. But I, I think you know, this, this Yorkshire is the region, and the North of England is the region that created the textile industry. You know, whether it be tied to salt, learning how to card fibers that nobody else could do, or the dyeing industry, which you know still resides, still has its center, centerpiece in Leeds. Um, or many of the fantastic fabric houses. And I think there's an opportunity for us to get our own city in order. And for me, some of those things might be kind of counter counterintuitive, but I think beyond there, we've, we're well positioned to be actually a big influencer. And I think mm. for me, that the big the big shift is, um, is in that creating value, because I, I think it was Councillor Hayden said about the French, you know, the fact is, they do buy more expensive clothes, but they're they're less trivialized and they, they cycle them around lesser. You know, they, they go mm. for, they go for style rather than fast rather than fast fashion. Um, I think um, pick, picking up on what, what Professor Russell picked up on around the, the shipping, I I'll be interested on that because I know when I've uh, I used to work in the tea and coffee industry, and actually when you do the carbon footprint of a cup of tea or a uh, a mug of coffee everyone thinks oh the shipping god you're bringing it from faf from... actually the shipping's a really small part mm. the biggest impact on a cup of tea or a cup of coffee the two biggest things are one boiling the kettle putting too much water in swamps anything to do with mm. the supply chain and the second is if you put milk in if you put milk in then and, and i think i think there's some comparable things with with fabric i think just the pure quantity of it you know the the, 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 the refining and the processing of polyester fiber um I mean, I, I, although I'm wearing a, fleece, a polyester fleece today, I, I do kind of try and wear a lot of merino and stuff and cotton. But I think, I think mm. locally, I think there's some educational stuff that we could do. Yep. Nationally, and although it doesn't seem to be the direction that we're going in in terms of our new bound sort of trade policies, but you know, we could sort of say that, you know, as, as Councillor Garthwaite was saying, you know, fast fashion shouldn't be abusive fashion. And I think, yeah. you know, we are big we are big consumers and there is the opportunity for us to say, well, actually, if you're going to sell to our country, you, you kind of, you manufacture your things ethically, you know, almost like a fair trade. Um, so there's a few different things, that, but I think stratifying it, stuff we can do locally in terms of messaging and stuff we can do with the industries <laughs> that we have in the UK and in, and in this region and things that we can do to sort of start to shift and nudge behaviour in the right direction. But yeah, there's a lot a lot to go at. That's it for Great. me. I'll shut up for now. No, no, thanks, Conrad. They were really useful, good points. I think there is a lot to go at. I want to bring in Councillor Ray, and then I want to sum up a few questions to put to Professor Russell and his team. Um, and then colleagues can add anything else they feel appropriate. So, Paul, next. Yeah, uh, some of the points have been, have been touched on, and I think it's uh, going to uh, Councillor Hartbrook's point about what we can do locally here in Leeds, I think, obviously, as can be, that's where we've got the greatest impact. And I think, you know, a lot of the fast fashion, now I wonder how many people have to sew. And actually, the basic skills of repairing clothing and maintaining it so it lasts 
longer. So we talk about class fashion. One reason why we do a lot of class fashion is actually probably the basic skill set of a lot of our residents is probably not what it used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago, where you would mm. darn your socks and you would sew and you would repair and you would reuse. I think we do need to be careful on some of the things around um, clothing in the waste cycle. A lot of charities make a huge amount of money off of getting textiles and fabrics in their recycle bins. So we need to be very careful about how we manage that, not to impact the charity sector. But there is probably growth space, actually maybe looking at our own estate of. I'm very mindful a lot of fashion is not picked up at a shop anymore. You don't go to a shop to buy fashion, you have it delivered. So actually taking on board the Council Flynn's points about where you would maybe drop off fashion actually is there something to do with our estate in terms of our community hubs and some of our sites where actually we create those localized collection points and then maybe we donate that to the Lord Mayor's chair or whatever you know we do something around that uh, but I do think there's actually as much as there's a, a really big piece on on the industrial side of this mm. and I will correct Councillor uh, however I do apologize uh, Yorkshire and Lancashire may have been the birthplace of industrialised steam production, but there's been textile production around the world on an industrial level for a very, very long time. So I think we need to be careful about rewriting our history. But in, in terms of, you know, there's stuff that can be done on the industrial and inside, but actually there's some basic fundamental skills and cultural issues we have within our own society around how we do value fashion, how we do value those basic skills that a lot of our parents and certainly our grandparents had, which created that kind of circular economy of actually, well, you stitch it up, you move it on, you give it to someone else, you just don't get rid of. Uh, but I do think there is a big, and, and actually uh, I think Councillor Buckley pointed, there is a big income inequality issue here that actually probably one of the main drivers of people buying fast fashion is not necessarily just cultural pressure. It's, it's what they can afford. And actually there's a real, real issue around income disparity and mm -hmm. inequality within particularly our larger cities uh, around accessibility to actually affordable clothing that, you know, that great analogy, the guy that buys it, uh, I'm, uh, paraphrasing here, the £10 boots has to replace them 10 times compared to the person that spends 100 quid on a pair of boots and has them for the next 30 or 40 years. There is, yeah. there is, we can't deny, it's not just a cultural thing, it's an income disparity issue that actually we also need to try alleviate the poverty side of things to give people the ability to buy once, keep, and not yeah. just have to churn through. Because actually, while that demand is there in the market, the market will keep producing cheap goods because there's a demand for it. If you start to kill off some of that demand, as well as take on the industrial side of things, as well as take on the cultural side of things and the skill sets people have, you have a multi-pronged attack on the carbon cost of clothing and fashion. And final point, you know, maybe we need maybe to help make the education point, maybe we need to stick a carbon cost on the labels, but who knows, that's something for national government. Excellent points, Councillor Ray. I think that was about two thirds of my summing up. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. No, but it, it, yeah, clothing and stroke fashion as a window into some of the sort of structural social economic problems we have. I think that's a really, a really, really good way of looking at it, Paul. Um, I think so just just to bring a few things together uh, and to cl close up this item. So, so I think clearly we've identified education and, and societal change as key, as key factors here. But looking at sort of the, the, the supply and production side of things, question for Professor Russell and his, his team is really, some of the, the, some of the, the, the products and programs and, and companies you've highlighted today, to put a really broad question out there, what's the sort of, what do you think, what's your opinion, of, what, what's the pathway and the timeline for those becoming the norm as opposed to some of the more destructive practices we have? That is a very big question. I'm not expecting an answer now. But, 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 but what we really help to get an answer now is, is where can we help? Certainly we have a, a sort of a, a large lobbying effort as a committee and as a council. We can add this to that. Of course we can. But any specific areas, short, medium, long-term where we can help? What would be sort of, um, are there any sort of legislative changes that need to need to be had? Just off the top of it, I mean, we can you can obviously follow this up with written answers to a committee because you know, we we try to have as much influence as possible, and we can reach a broad range of political actors as a, as a committee. Um, so just just put some questions out there to to Professor Rotten and his team to wrap up this item for, for five minutes. 
Okay, I'll try and be quick, um, Neil, just on the first question yeah. regarding time frame. Um, another reason why we're working on, on each of these projects with groups of companies is, is so that they're implementable. Mm. So already they're implementing, for example, some of the new technologies we've been developing and the new ways of uh, consuming materials or manufacturing or retailing. So it, it's about rethinking all of those things, and not just doing what we did before with a few tweaks, right? So, so yeah. there, there are projects that I think we've got year timeframes on rather than months, but it, it's a range. We, we, regarding um, what we could do with Leeds, I, I think the comment was made earlier on about Leeds could be a really big influencer here because every, every city in the UK is grappling with these problems, but they don't have future fashion factory on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the industrial infrastructure that we have here as well. So in terms of engaging with communities around, you know, how we promote reuse and recycling, how we think about other ways of consuming, people are talking in some cases about leasing, um, you know, and other models that are enabled now on the internet as well. But that, that's an, that could be really very, very useful. And, um, because we have companies in this in in this area as well um, who, who are trying to grapple with these challenges, I think it would be all ears um, uh, to, to what came out of that. And finally, just it is worth mentioning on the legislative front, um, the DEFRA is consulting on extended producer responsibility for textiles. Uh, there is increasing uh, the, the wind of changes uh, towards. Um, putting EPR restrictions or, or EPR and an EPR framework around textiles. So it's not just left to, you know, <laughs> to the market in inverted commas. There will be a requirement to design products for the end of life, to think, of, to invest in the infrastructure for sorting, for collection, sorting, recycling, and so on. And, um, you yeah, know, not, not just to forget about it and think it's somebody else's job. Um, and you know, part of that is how do you finance it? And that might be linked to the EPR scheme itself because it could end up being a tax on producers to fund the other end of the uh, mm -hmm. supply chain. So, um, yeah, th those are my uh, reactions to, to, to the questions as quickly as I could. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, sir. I think it'd be, it'd be really helpful if you could send us the details of that consultation. That'd be something I would appreciate we can look into. Um, like I said, we tried to, to have as a uh, great a uh, lobbying uh, reach as possible. Has any colleagues got any further comments? And we'll wrap this, this really interesting item up. And it's clearly the first first pass at this. I think we're going to be revisiting here a lot more and I think we might see more of Professor Russell and his team in the future. There's there's a lot of opportunities. I think what we've really touched upon is it's a really good, it's a really good window on the what a transition to a no carbon economy might look like and to a circular economy might look like and what are the threats and the opportunities. I just would say that if, if trade is going to become perhaps more localised, consumption patterns are going to become perhaps more localised. One of the things to consider is, say, one of the differences between now it's 2022 and I went to university in <coughs> 1993 is that um, the economic development patterns of, say, South Asia have changed dramatically in that almost 30-year period. Oh, my word. But, you know, so, for example, India, Bangladesh, that have a have a significant and, and rapidly growing middle class, build. and this tip, the, the growth of the middle class has typically been a driver of local consumption, local economic development, and consumption patterns. So that's something to consider that we perhaps um, need to think a bit more of what opportunities we can find locally, because the disbenefits in places like Bangladesh might be a lot less than we're perhaps concerned about, because those places have changed remarkably in that thirty-year period. I'm now reconciled to fact it's nearly 30 years since I first went to university. Right. On that note, folks, I'm going to call up this item. Thank you very much, Professor Russell and your team. Thanks, colleague uh, Susie and co for contributing. Um, we're, going to, we're going to be revisiting this. You're most welcome to stay, but we are going to move on to our next item, which is uh, uh, the Future Talent Plan update. Um, so over to colleagues. Hi, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, it is still morning. I'm just checking my time there. Um, so I'm Fiona Bolam and I'm the Head of Economic Policy uh, for the Council. And I'm going to uh, 
just to re briefly introduce this item before I hand over to Minakshi, who's going to share some slides and is going to talk to you about this. Minakshi has been leading this work and she'll talk to you all about what we've been doing and what this is. So one of the actions that we set out in the economic recovery framework that published, I was going to say last year, but it might have been actually the year before. I'm slightly losing track here, but never mind, um, which, which was to reset and renew our skills and talent plan for the city. Um, the previous skills and talent plan had been put together in 2017. And I think we can all agree that um, the labour market has seen a huge amount of changes in that quite short space of time. So it was one of the first things that we did want to look at. We've obviously seen a lot of previous trends being accelerated for instance, in the, uh, the digital industries, um, as well as that impact on the labour market and skills around COVID um, and Brexit and the, sort of the need to transition to net zero as well. So it was this was a timely thing that we wanted to do now. Um, our new plan that we're pulling together at the moment will promote sort of employment, diversity, inclusion, support skills development and improve resilience as well as we recover from COVID and try to address the climate emergency. We're hoping that it will also create confidence with um, for employers, for skills providers, uh, inward investors and for people who want to uh, improve their skills. So I'm going to hand over to Minakshi now um, to share her slides and to take you through this presentation. Thank you. Can you see that? Just checking. Yep, yep. Go for it. Yeah. Um, so uh, good to see you all today. Um, in terms of what the project has included, um, we have undertaken a review of the previous talent and skills plan that Fiona has uh, referred to to determine the progress that's been made um, and ensure continuity. Our main phase of research um, of a review of debt policy, best practice and benchmarking um, is now complete. Um, we've put a focus on more detailed qualitative and quantitative analysis to better understand labour market trends, including a data workshop with colleagues from um, Open Innovations, formerly the ODI, um, on, um, in November last year. We've established a steering group to provide core stakeholder representation, uh, for example, including stakeholders from digital and health to better promote the project across members' networks. Um, we want to crowdsource the development of our new future talent plan um, and the main way we've done this is through uh, two consultation conversations delivered by our partner Clever Together. Hopefully you will manage to see that and take part. Um, and um, the main conversation launched for a month uh, last year and the second smaller validation conversation, which I'll go on to explain, um, took place in November. So yeah, we've really tried to... Um, do extensive stakeholder engagement to ensure to reach our conversations um, and filling gaps around this. So we held um, a youth focus group and also a round table with BAME organisations in the city and also uh, BAME members of staff from the council. Oh, sorry, it's just again for some reason, apologies. Um, so um, in terms of um, the first conversation, um, the aim was to gather insight um, about the skills we have now in Leeds, um, what the future skills uh, might be, the challenges faced in delivering those requirements, um, and also what the city can do to help to address these challenges. So we were pleased because we had 360 participa participants um, and 1,142 different contributions with all age groups represented, 15% uh, having a disability or long-term health conditions, and 14 different ethnic groups taking part, which was in line with the 2011 census data for Leeds. So um, contributors were most engaged in this first conversation with two main topics, so skills in demand, um, and no surprises that digital was topping the list there, but also um, people were talking about healthcare and caring professions, soft skills and also green skills. Um, in terms of support needed from the city, this was a, another topic people were engaged with, and this was around holistic career services, apprenticeships, and um, integrated industry and education. So two main overarching challenges 
were identified by people regarding the future of work. So need for employers to be more adaptable. Um, so, um, for example, like promoting working from home um, and the need to transform education, both in what and how it delivers. So, for example, balancing academic and technical skills in the education system. So eight main action areas um, were identified by us from this that we went on to validate um, and they're just listed there. So um, our validation conversation um, was about putting these actions back to people and asking them what was strong, wrong or missing um, to helping us to refine our action plan. And we had 221 participants joining this conversation, 91 not having previously taken part in the first conversation. Um, and broadly speaking, the majority of the participants in the validation conversation strongly agreed with the action plan. Um, an agreement was shown um, in the form of light. Um, as opposed to new ideas and comments from the first conversation. So um, below are some examples of um, support. So um, people um, supported the ideas of um, support for employers to develop their workforce. Um, people made minor amendments, such as um, the need to think about jobs suitable for over 50s as well as services. Um, an example of a major amendment was um, in terms of education, the issue goes wider than the needs to be tackled at a national level. So in terms of our final project, um, in terms of the style and scope, um, we, um, were, we are looking to provide a more simplified structure um, with two main action areas. So growing the economy with better skills, jobs, and city and aligning education and training infrastructure to support this um, and this was feedback from our steering group um, to ensure the plan's memorability with stakeholders because at the end of the day it's a plan for the city um, and it really needs to be used by them so um, we are proposing realistic actions um, and we are going out to stakeholders to co-produce these that are practical specific and deliverable we want it to be underpinned by a long-term vision. So even though the plan is intended to run for three to five years, um, we understand the importance of having a long-term vision, but also to ensure that it's agile um, so we can go back and um, change things that aren't working, um, remove actions when they're complete. So the format is a um, website design. Um, so we really want it to be dynamic, colorful and accessible. And we're also looking at how it can be backed by stakeholders in its implementation. So um, using the business anchors private sector progression framework, um, potentially using the anchors progression framework as well, um, where um, organisations rate their progress on certain areas, including employment, um, and also setting up a six monthly delivery group um, for monitoring purposes with some of these core stakeholders we've identified in the project so far. So in terms of the green link, um, we really recognise the increasing demand for green skills um, and supporting skills development, um, particularly um, targeting economically inactive, those furthest away from the labour market um, and around low paid and insecure work. We're also recognising um, the need for targeted employment and skills support for high carbon transition sectors. Um, we've got our green economy project and economic policy, which is um, already underway and looking at opportunities in the green economy um, in conjunction with the Centre for Progressive Policy. Um, and um, the, the agility of our plan means um, actions can feed into that project. Mm. And vice versa. So um, we've also, um, we're in conversation with the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission um, and Andy Goldson um, to set up a listening event um, with businesses um, and industry to further engage around green skills needs, opportunities and challenges. So using their contacts and our, our contacts as well. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, as I said, um, going out to key stakeholders to develop some of the actions, uh, collating best practice in Leeds um, as a reference point to stakeholders when they're using the plan. Um, and drafting the plan, aiming to take it to executive board in spring. So um, that's it for the presentation um, and look forward to hearing any thoughts and comments. Thank you.
Uh, no, thanks, Manak. That was uh, that was really interesting. So I, I particularly pleased to hear about agility, because you've if you've heard any of the previous items, you've seen there's obviously an awful lot of change coming to to fashion and textiles and and, and clothing. So um, in a similar way that an awful lot of change is already happening in 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 development and building. Um, so in terms of opening up for colleagues, Councillor Ray. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on the the the, the green job bit yep. to a certain extent. But I think it's it's a much more broader point of this, and it's about the ex- accessibility of those people already currently within the labour market to access mm. some of these jobs. A lot of these jobs are going to be relatively high skilled, have relatively high uh, entry requirements. And if you've someone that's worked in an industry for 20 or 30 years, that then should that has to change or close down. And then you're trying to re-enter the labour market and all of a sudden you're being asked to have qualifications and skills that you were never taught that instantly cuts you out of that market. Uh, we have unfortunately a tendency of doing that in this council to a greater or lesser extent with some of the entry requirements to some of our jobs. And I am worried that the professionalization of quite a lot of industries which is not necessarily a bad thing in itself actually excludes a huge number of people that are actually at a massive disadvantage either economically or time because actually they're already in the workforce and these skills were never taught or actually they just don't have the financial or time means to access the educational requirements or skills training requirements to access those jobs. So what work is actually being done on an accessibility to that to those particular groups? And in particular, of actually trying to get us as an institution, because we'll obviously be employing some people in Greenfield, but also a lot of these anchor institutions, not to over-professionalise the requirements to enter and to actually emphasise on learning on the job rather than you've got to turn up and know everything to begin with. Yeah. I think those are really, really good questions. The, particularly phrasing it like the over-professionalisation. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Um, colleagues, in response to Council Rays. So can I, I'll come back in and apologies, we haven't, uh, a, a colleague from Employment and Skills has, has been unable to join us this morning. So I may have yes. to come back and give you a written answer to some of it. Um, I do know that we are recruiting a green skills lead at the moment to sort of like work with the sector. Um, we can take the point back to the anchors um, in terms of what we need. We know it already that there is a sort of a mismatch um, between sort of the, the kind of levels of skills that will be needed and perhaps, and with the jobs that are going it is something that we are aware of um, I know employment and skills are working with uh, Polly's team and others to look at sort of apprenticeship programs as well into sort of some of those areas um, yeah. around this and also working with Wicca it is all still at an early stage um, but there are things ongoing and I'll try and come back with a, a written answer on the other aspects okay thanks Fiona that's that's much appreciated um Paul, was that a further question you had? To- yeah, it, it was more just to press the point. I, I appreciate it's been looked at, but if you look at a city like Leeds, with its levels of multiple deprivation, mm. uh, some of the skill sets of some of our poorest communities, this isn't a mute point. This is these people's future employment. And actually, if I'm a large organisation, I'll be completely blunt, and I've got someone that actually has a skill set I've already got in terms of they've got a piece of paper, and actually someone who doesn't, I'm more likely going to go for the person that does. We are, this is, this is not a new point. This is potentially the jobs and the careers of hundreds of thousands of people in this city in the long term, because we have a habit now across all industries of having unreasonable entry requirements into occupations, whereas 20, 30, 40 years ago, you did have a proper apprenticeship and they taught you on the job. And I do nest sometimes worry some of our apprenticeships are actually upskilling current staff and not actually an entry point into the market for a lot of people who are either going to have to change job or simply because our education system isn't working in the way it should do, and that's not the fault of the teachers, that's the fault of the policymakers, in terms of actually equipping them with the necessary skill sets to enter these markets. So I'm really, really stressing the point here. It's not a mute point. This is going to make or break the difference for hundreds of thousands of families, not just in this city, but millions across this country. No, I, I agree entirely, Paul. And I think it, 
to my mind, and I think a lot of members of this committee's mind would be that a just transition is um, present affords us an, uh, probably almost unparalleled opportunity to break cycles of deprivation and poverty uh, with good dignified endeavour that's well paid. And I think that's what we need to be seizing. And I think we're certainly try, trying to. Polly, do you want to come in? No, just try to set councillors Ray mind at rest a little bit when we talk about apprentices we are talking about entry level jobs um, and we're support we're working with an organization called generation uk this year so we're going to have the second ever um, retrofit coordinator boot camp in the city for people who've maybe been out of employment um, so targeting people and we've worked with our supply chain to be able to actually offer those people interviews at the end of that boot camp so we are really really targeting that entry level and people who are struggling with employment rather than you know like you say over professionalizing it and and mm. trying to find career paths and also finding entry level jobs that you can come into but then they do have a career path to them that's attractive um yep. so looking at it from both points of view so that is absolutely what we're focusing on when fiona referred to the sort of the apprentice side Retrofit boot camp, excellent, excellent expression. Um, anything else from colleagues on the ongoing work? Not seeing any indications. Okie dokie. Well, that close the that item up. Thank you, thanks, um, Fiona and Actually, that's really, really good. Good to know that what's going on. Um, all right, right. In that case, that was the end of our sort of substantive items. Harriet, what's the date and time of our next meeting before I bring up any of the business? Thanks, Chair. Uh, the date of the, the next consultative meeting will yep. be Wednesday, the 9th of March at 10 a.m. 9th of March, 10 a.m. Excellent. Okay. Has anyone got any A or B? Councillor Illingworth, I see you have. Uh, yeah, yes, Chair. Very brief. Just to point out that the Excellent presentation. I didn't say anything, but I was listening and learning a lot today, and I really enjoyed it, and it was thoroughly good. Um, but one practical difficulty I had, if you go to the uh, uh, Democracy website, it will tell you that there's no papers for this meeting, uh, and the meeting has been cancelled. But if you obviously follow the link provided uh, with the invitation, then it takes you to a, a functional website that's very useful and informative. Uh, I just want to make sure people are aware this is happening uh, because we're meant to be open to the public and encourage people to take part and it involves advertising our goods and stuff adequately. In, indeed it is. I'm sure that's something that Harriet can sort out ASAP. Um, not a problem. Um, Councillor Fosse. Um, my apologies if I've sort of um, nodded off or something at a previous meeting or missed an email. Is the finance working group going to be meeting again? I didn't, I think we had one meeting. Is there another meeting planned or? There, it, there it was is. very, very helpful. Yes. What's there, it, it, there is. And I'm looking at Polly to bail me out because my mind's gone blank about when it next is coming up. Yep, there is. And it was going to be scheduled after Christmas. And in, in, to be totally honest, it's just been resource at the moment. We're yep. trying to juggle rather a lot of things so it's it's still there and needs to happen but we haven't got it scheduled in yet we'll we'll get that sorted as soon as possible uh council for safe um and we'll get again we'll get details out to CAC members and uh, obviously it's open to all members of council want to bring in utilize all our talents I haven't got any other indications to any items of the business well thank you very much folks that was particularly the first item i think it's one of the most a very engaging discussion. It's actually one of the most heartening items I think we've brought, had a while brought to us as well. Because there's clearly so much going on that could really genuinely address some of the issues that, that uh, fashion presents to us. I think that's, yeah, really heartening. That's how I describe it. But listen, let's wrap things up. Thank you very much, everybody, for your contributions today. And have a safe journey to wherever you're going. I'm going downstairs to make lunch myself. So I'm going to close the